So joining our series on this episode is John Rothwell, AO, Founding Director and Non-Executive Chair of Austal. John, incredible story and incredible business that you've built over so many years now. We'll get to that, but before we do, I thought we'd talk about your background to begin. Born in the Netherlands, but migrated to Australia in 1954, as I understand it? Correct. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. So I was 10 years old in 54. I came to what for a 10-year-old boy is a remarkable uh, adventure country. Um, very simple background, early days as a, as a school with a single teacher doing all six grades. Um, played cricket on the road out the front. Um, uh, we didn't have enough people to make up a football team, including the girls uh, of, of an age. Uh, so uh, we we had everyone in. I guess I'm sidetracking. The whole experience is remarkable. Uh, this it was uh, a very simple house. Uh, there was no electricity. Uh, the toilet was out the back in a tin shed, as you as you well know we do in Australia. But uh, at that age, it was just a remarkable experience. And uh, I took to Australian rules football really quickly. I was a tall kid, fairly active sort of kid. Uh, couldn't speak any English when I came here, but yet I don't ever recall that. It just you learn on the way and learn quite quickly. Um, so, no, remarkable early days um, at uh, since arriving here. All the memories are good, and I love this country, and uh, always have. You sort of touched on it there, but first impressions of Australia and what was the 1950s and, and 60s, obviously a very different place today, but tell us about some of those early experiences during school you mentioned uh, playing football, but but tell us a little bit about the the latter stage of your schooling career. Yeah, so I didn't do a lot of that schooling. Uh, so I was uh, we were a migrant family, six children in the family. Uh, there were two reasons why I didn't do a lot of schooling. One is it suited me because I wanted to be a man. I didn't want to be at school. Secondly, it kind of suited my parents, I think, to have everyone earning rather than uh, than being at school. But. But I guess um, to try and uh, answer your question more accurately, um, first up, it was a very primitive lifestyle early days. It was a two-mile walk to school, barefooted. The first car we had was a 1936 canvas top Ford V8. Um, my father was just a, a labouring type guy, worked in the railway and did other stuff. So that... Uh, uh, and that initial period, we grew. I grew up in um, in Oakford, which is near Byford, which doesn't mean much to you or your audience, but it's it's a very small place. Um, and but we moved from there to Naval Base, which uh, is really only about uh, it'd be four or five kilometres south of where we're sitting here right now. So that was my first. Uh, contact or real interest in the sea, I suppose. I recall correctly, you left school at about age 15 or so, and then between 15 and 22, you tried your hand at a number of jobs. You were a welder, steel fabricator, transport driver. Tell me about uh, where this practical ability to, to use your hands and to build things came from. Yeah, it was it was natural. Um, I've always loved making making things. Um, I made my first boat uh, at the age of about 13. Had a motorcycle engine in it and uh, and bits that I got for nothing, but it uh, it was the first boat I built. So I could always do stuff with my hands, interested in developing that. Um, I did, uh, when I was first married, uh, I did some small uh, welding type business but it was very much a, a backyard type business. It was just uh, stuff that I did. But I think uh, from there, I was interested in sailing uh, and I built a couple of 36 foot steel sail yachts, one for my brother and one for myself. Um, that, uh, and to be fair, uh, I never ever sailed that boat. Uh, it became the capital for the boat building business, Star Boats, uh, and it wasn't huge capital, but it was, uh, nevertheless, uh, the boats were completed in the hills, 
and and sold. And I then started um, started boat building, um, smaller type trailer boats, I guess, which grew. Let's talk about it. Dad Star Boats, which I think you launched in 1972. What was the opportunity that you saw? You obviously had some previous experience in, in sort of building boats at home, but where did you see that the market opportunity was to actually launch your own business? I'm not sure whether it uh, it was thought about all that much. It was probably just done. Uh, I, I believe that, um, that there was an opportunity for the heavier plate type aluminium boats. It was, it was a different country then, um, you know, and... Uh, strong men had four-wheel drives and went fishing with strong boats and and so it went so that was the theme uh, that I guess I worked on but it was probably more expressing myself of making stuff uh, and uh, and the boats uh, and the boat building did that for me. Before Long Star Boats had, had grown nationally it had uh, operations in <coughs> Geraldton, Brisbane and Perth and you had a range of customers dive boat operators, cray fishermen, abalone divers and, and the like Walk me through the evolution of that business between, say, 1972 to, to the 80s. How did you manage that growth? Yes, yeah, so I had inquiries for boats in Queensland. Department of Customs needed a, a, a number of boats. I had inquiries from Victoria, uh, and uh, I had uh, there was a need for uh, there was a, a, a very big demand for our cray fishing or rock lobster type boats here on this coast. So I think one thing led to another. First up, the the first expansion might have been into Brisbane, I think, uh, where I did a number of boats for the policing authorities substantially, but also lots of little pleasure boats uh, for people to tow around. I had distributors in Victoria, New South Wales, um, Darwin, in fact, all the states. Uh, the I used to supply the abalone divers in South Australia um, out of Port Lincoln. So it was, um, I guess, it was just a natural, uh, you know, expansion. Uh, as the need arose, I try to lift my game. As I understand, you're using heavy plate aluminium for for strength, but it was also a lightweight material to use as well. To what extent did that have a that um, innovation have a competitive advantage over over some of what the other boat builders in, in Perth and around Australia were doing at the time. Aluminium trailable boats at that time were largely stretched aluminium over a mould and they were lightweight as they still are being made. So the advantage I think I mainly had was I was the first in Australia to do that and it just took off and people wanted it. Since then there have been Many, many follow-on uh, businesses doing the same thing. But I was the first, and it was just, it had appeal. Uh, so really the popular material at that time was fiberglass, uh, fi- fiberglass trailable boats. And I, I think the, I, I guess the slogan we used to use, it doesn't rust, rot, water, log, or warp. Was, I can recall saying that over and over again. But it had appealed to the to the boating public, uh, to the fishing type uh, public and to the to the regulators as well customs and uh, coastal water police uh, I did here so it it was um, it was just sought after because it was strong robust and uh, and we were the first to do it so then along comes 1984 and you're approached by a business called Quintex Corporation or later to become Quintex Corporation that had Alan Bond as an investor tell us about how that deal all came together so uh, Queensland Merchant Holdings, and quite frankly, I don't quite know where they came from. They were a listed entity. I, th- I think they were a listed entity. They decided they wanted to get into boat building and they approached three yards in Western Australia and purchased those assets. So our, my star boats was one of those. It was Precision Marine and there was another one, Riverfront Boat Builders. So Queensland Merchant Holdings didn't seem to be a very robust business. I don't think it had a lot of, um, I, you know, I don't think it was a very strong business. It was taken over by, by Quintex. So, so really it was, if we skip over Queensland Merchant Holdings, it became Quintex who had the interest. Now, I then had to, as part of the sales contract, I had to work for them for a period of time. So I, uh, I had a contract um, 
for two and a half years to work. Initially, I managed their aluminium boat uh, production. Uh, then I became an uh, international marketing guy for the aluminium boats, so I traveled to different places uh, that we'd sold to, Middle East and so forth. Um, but in essence, uh, you know, and I think I can say that uh, comfortably now, Quintex wasn't a very well-run business either, so it was, uh, it was very strange to someone like myself that was very hands-on and, and made everything work, or wanted to make everything work. Um, so I guess if I keep going on that track, it was clear they weren't going to make it. I had worked out my uh, my um, contract for the two and a half years. I had absolutely rejected any uh, non-compete clause beyond the time I served so I could go back into business making boats. Uh, and at that time, Quintex weren't looking good. I took 12 months off to try and... Um, to try and make sure there was no allegation of, you know, my stealing their business. They were on a slide and I then invited uh, four initially of my ex-employees, young blokes uh, that were hands-on boat builders to come and join me. One of those dropped off after a short period of time, but the other three stayed with me and I know I, I'll go back one I invited them around to my house one day on a Sunday and I said, hey guys, I think we ought to be building boats and you guys are invited if you want to join me. And it was as casual as that. Um, so I had uh, a vision that uh, my, uh, China was a substantial potential market for us. Uh, and um, so they joined me. Uh, wasn't a lot of capital. I paid up capital was two hundred thousand dollars. So uh, it was, but I always felt that it wasn't about capital. It was about can-do attitude and and so forth. And we did very well. They were great young guys. If I give you some dimension to that, the the oldest of those was twenty-eight. The youngest was twenty-three, and I was forty-four. So very much a young team, but. It was a, an attitude of, we're going to do this and uh, nothing's going to get in our way. Now, if I recall correctly, the two and a half years that you were international sales and marketing manager for Quintex, you were doing a lot of travel into Asia and in particular in China. To what extent did that then provide the genesis and the impetus for seeing that there was an opportunity to do large commercial vessels, exactly like you were doing here in Australia, but, but in the Chinese market? During the Quintex time, Whilst I travelled and tried to uh, to work those markets, it didn't work. Um, we didn't really sell anything very much, and Quintex was already on a downhill slide. It was fairly close to the bottom, by the in that last twelve months or so that uh, that I was there. So, what it did do, uh, and I think that is uh, the takeaway, it identified for me that there was a market out there, there was a real market out there, and if it was done right, uh, we could work it. So 1988, you launched Austral, as you said, with, with three of the other uh, young partners, three or four of the other young guys that were in the business at the time. What happened next? How did you the, take the next step for the business? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I did a, a, I was short of a finance guy. Um, one of the people that came out of Quintex who could see that it was uh, not going to last all that much long rang me one day and said, John, you need a finance guy and you need me. So he joined us. Um, but uh, I then, uh, I, I, I guess one of the things that we did early on was develop a business plan. Uh, and it was a very casual arrangement. So we'd go away for a long weekend, uh, uh, drink wine for the second half and do business planning from between six and midday or something like that, do you know? But it was a, it was a very thorough, clear vision of where we wanted to be. Um, and, uh, and we identified the challenges quite early in the piece. Um, and that business plan I still have today and it's fun to read back in it every now and again, but but that was done in the first six months or so of us, us being setting Austal up. Uh, it identified where the markets were, what the strengths and weaknesses were, the way business plans used to be done. It's nowhere near as common now, but it, it, um, 
it identified where we needed to be and we already projected even though I'd only ever and my team had only ever built vessels up to 40 meters in length we already identified that we should be in the 100 meter range and we should be expanding to uh, at least paramilitary type vessels so early in the piece so so that was setting up the business plan I next went off to China and started in Hong Kong to find a suitable agent, uh, one with language skills, cultural skills, and so forth. He and I then uh, travelled into China, uh, where he had some opportunity, and, and our first port of call was uh, a place called Nantong up the Yangtze River, um, uh, up north. Um, and, uh, and we found a potential buyer for a 40-metre boat, which was our first foreign contract and our first really major uh, um, uh, venture into that, into that product range. And I, I think uh, that was a, a phenomenal experience for me. Uh, it was a great learning experience. Um, and, uh, and, as, and I could I'll just elaborate on that a little bit. Um, so I, I think... As an Australian uh, and a regular uh, sort of the way we do business, I assume that if I had the right specification, a good price with not too much fat in it, but leaving little profit for us, uh, they ought to be happy with that. But it didn't work out that way. It was, <laughs> it was like uh, the negotiation took nine days and it was a room full of people one person negotiating the the head of the company, but it was like a, like a show almost. It was just, and this thing went on and on. And then we we close for dinner, and, and drink lots of uh, uh, Chinese multi, and then they'd go want to go back and do another session. But I guess uh, what I learnt was really harsh les lessons that today we would say elementary. The first thing they did was they they fought me about the price of the vessel that I'd submitted. So we got to something that I thought I could live with. They then started on the specification. The specification went up. The price had been determined foolishly. I got to the end of that, something I could live with. They then started on the contractual terms. Do, do you know? uh, so I guess my lesson has been get all those other things out of the road <laughs> before you start talking about money. But nevertheless, uh, the contract was signed. Um, it was subject to a form of soft loan out of Australia. Australian government was providing a soft loan. The contract was signed, um, and I'll just stay with that one for a moment because it's quite uh, uh, quite interesting. The Tiananmen Square problem happened, um, and we were we'd signed our contract. The government had agreed to the loan. The government froze it and said, "China is no longer a friend. Uh, you know, uh, we can't proceed with it." So it was. Fairly unfortunate. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, China somehow redeemed itself. Political uh, bridges were built uh, and we were able to complete that vessel. And we did make some money. So from that first uh, ship in China, you then largely built aluminium passenger ferry service in China, as we've mentioned, Singapore, Indonesia, with some 30 ferries sold to these markets within the first six years. As I understand it, then an opportunity for an investor in Bill Ferris came along around about 1994, who acquired, I think, a $15 million stake in the business. How did that deal come together? So prior to answering that question, I'm just going to touch on one other bit that might amuse you or so, uh, is of interest. The Chinese contracts all ha needed a 100% bank guarantee uh, performance bank guarantee for the contract. Now, I wouldn't have been worth a million dollars back in those days, and the vessels we were selling were five million US. So to get 100% guarantee was fairly difficult. Anyhow, we managed uh, one round. I was in London attending a ferry uh, exhibition. My office rang and said, John, can you call into Hong Kong? There's an opportunity for another, uh, another ferry there. Uh, the first one I had secured with uh, Standard Chartered Bank, I think I can mention that now, who had come out. I, I first went to the, um, the government agencies 
and said, what about this? This is export. You've got to be helping us. They shook their head with sadness and said, I think you're biting off more than you can chew. And a chartered bank, uh, Standard Chartered uh, agreed to do that. Um, based simply on our own securities, which didn't add up to all that much. The other boys didn't have a lot. Uh, I was seen coming back from London, and they said there's another opportunity for another ferry. So I signed a contract for a second one in, in Hong Kong, and I thought you've got to be the world's greatest optimist. You know, you've just got a $5 million uh, bank guarantee out of Standard Chartered, uh, and I'd signed it subject to that guarantee being provided, came back to Western Australia, went to our state government and said, you've got to help me with this. And they said, sorry, uh, that's not what we do. So I went back to my standard chartered people and they said, oh, well, we're in for one, we might as well be in for two. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, it, uh, and frankly, without them, we wouldn't be where we are today. So that developed into 28 odd vessels for uh, China at that time. So um, I guess I'll just leave that, but it was an interesting part of our history that sometimes you just need a leg up or you need someone to listen. And frankly, uh, you know, I'd approached our banks down here and a normal one. One of them uh, had said, yeah, we can do that and gave me a letter accordingly. And then later on their finance department pulled it and I said, that's wasted two of my weeks so that's going to cost you, and I charge him for my time. But never mind, uh, we'll get back to uh, the Bill Ferris uh, arrival. So Bill uh, was the chair of Austrade at the time when we first met. I was uh, in Hong Kong visiting one of our customers riding on an Austral ferry um, that we had built. They predominantly traded between Hong Kong and mainland China. Bill was on the ferry. He and I struck up a conversation and, and a friendship. And we stayed with that and he keeps joking about charging up the Pearl River with a 40 meter, 40 knot ferry, causing massive wash either side. We thought these people have got to have something. Bill's a character guy and uh, most enjoyable and has remained a good friend. Um, so Bill was, though, nevertheless, he had an organisation called um, Australian Mezzanine Investment, and they were just, as the description is, they were mezzanine investors. So when you, in our case, when we achieved successes, we were approached by a number of different um, mezzanine-type investors um, wanting a piece of that. Uh, and I kept thinking, do we really need a bank on board, you know, but I enjoyed Bill and I respected his skills, his intelligence uh, and his ethics. Um, so we finally came to agreement that he would get 30% of Austal for $15 million, I, I think the number was. Now, issue was, of course, we'd started off with 200000 so not too far up the track. 30% became $15 million, so you can see it had increased in value a fair bit during that initial period. Bill was a, was a great board member. He had a, um, a joint investor, a fellow out of Hong Kong, um, a, um, a British guy. Uh, both of those joined my board and I think the, <clears throat> the value I got from them was it prepared me for uh, much more for a listed company. It prepared me for a different uh, business, if you know what I mean. They had far greater professional skills than what I had. Bill was, uh, he was always in business. He, was, he came out of Harvard. He did a Harvard education, but, but a good guy, knew, knew what he was on about. So really good, solid um, a business uh, board member. Um, of course, being a mezzanine investor, he had an exit plan. Uh, and and I guess, no, I'll just go back one. The reason for accepting it was we had enough cash. We didn't need cash, but I didn't have any growth money. Uh, we, needed, uh, we needed to be able to do the large ferries, and uh, we were sailing by the seat of our pants, as the saying used to go. Um, so we brought Bill in. Then uh, w while he was on board, and I seem to think that might have been for about three years or thereabouts, um, 
again, we uh, he wanted to think about exiting, um, uh, at least as investment. He stayed on for a little while as a board member, but uh, at least as investment. Um, and um, I was again in a situation where we had enough money to buy him out, but I didn't really want to do that. We would have been left cashless again. Uh, so we then considered, should we list, should we not list? Uh, and uh, that was probably a difficult uh, decision for me. Nevertheless, that's what we did, uh, raise more capital. And since then, uh, the story has become Austral as you know it today, or at least the, the genesis of Austral as you see it today. Before we get into the listing in 1998, I want to get an understanding as to building relationships. You were so prolific in terms of finding new customers in Asia originally, and then you pivoted to all. Different are uh, doing deals with those two sort of business cultures, and how did you go about building relationships there in, in Europe? Yeah, so one of my young partners it was a naval architect. Uh, he was the uh, the twenty three year old that joined us. Very bright young guy, uh, and uh, and a great salesman. It, uh, not not in the traditional sales sense, but he just appealed to people, and he knew what he was on about. So Chris did most of that uh, that footwork through Europe. Uh, and the European market accepted Chris, even though he was very young. Uh, the Western culture is, if you're smart enough, we'll deal with you. That didn't work in Asia. So I used to continue to do Asia. I was just a bit more mature and uh, they like to meet someone and deal with someone that was a bit more mature. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I'll, I'll tell you one interesting story. The first of the car ferries that we did was around 80 metres. Um, we, it was ordered uh, by a, a Brit, um, hard-nosed, American-born, grown-up Brit. Um, and uh, we, it was our first ferry. We had uh, misjudged in our calculations the potential speed. Uh, we started to build the vessel. We had a contract with an option for three more of the same. Um, and uh, we miscalculated the speed. We're only out by a little bit. So in 40 knots, we're out by about half a knot. But that allowed him to really crucify us. Um, so on top of that, he had what he thought us on the ropes. Um, where um, he missed a payment, and um, he uh, he he'd, he'd uh, no prior to that he'd come here, and he said, uh, "Oh, let's talk about exercising those options." Of course, I don't want to pay any adjustments that you might have in mind. I want to buy buy them for a lot less money. So at that stage, I'd realised there was no money in this contract. It's going to be hard to break even. We weren't going to do any any um, options, option vessels. So we let him go back, um, and uh, he missed the payment. And I was worried about uh, calling a default on the contract because I thought we might not have delivered drawings on time, and there might be a way out for him. So then he missed the next payment, which was on launch, and I was very comfortable that uh, we had him. So I called a default uh, on the contract. Again, he, he was a bully, you know, a small company. Would just get, so he, um, he, I, I got a very abusive call from him. Uh, you know, what are you doing? I'll ruin you guys and this, that, and the other. And, uh, and he... In the end, um, I had Chris chase the world to see whether there was a buyer for it. He found a potential one with Danish Rail in Denmark. As I've said, the, the speed shortfall was only about half a knot. It wasn't serious, but it was enough for him to hold a gun to her head. So I rang him one day and I said, James is his name and I won't bore you with the rest of his name because he's, he was well known in the UK. Um, but I said, James, I don't know whether you're getting your advice, but um, if you uh, if you want to just proceed with this cancellation of the contract, 
we'll just give you back your money as are the terms of the contract. If you don't, though, if you don't want to agree, we'll go into a long battle. You're going to lose this. You're getting bad advice. You're going to lose this, and you'll end up nowhere. So we cancelled the contract. We sold the vessel to the Danes. We had a very angry bully at the other end, and we made an extra $3 million of cook money. <laughs> so a bit of fun. Business is like that. There, there are moments. Um, but where were we? You talked about how did I get this spread through Europe? That was certainly the first last large ferry that went into Europe. We then did one in uh, in Germany, and I think Chris would have been responsible for making the contacts. I travelled with him from time to time if it needed a little bit of image, or if but he was very capable in his own right. So that developed, that was Europe. Uh, Asia, we did uh, Japan. I had an agent in Japan, although that never resulted in many orders. Uh, China, you've heard the story, that just kept happening. And we did an occasional one, there was one to Singapore and so forth. I think the next big change was the US, if you want me to lead into that right now. So... We had a, uh, uh, I'll just, uh, um, no, let me go back to, to uh, um, R&D money. We had a fellow here, a naval arc, who said, John, these catamarans, twin hull boats that you're building are nowhere near as good as a trimaran. Uh, you need to give me a couple of years and some money and I'll develop a trimaran for you. And, he, and we gave him that money and we let him go, locked himself away. We built the first one of those for um, Canary Islands, a, a large 127-metre, 350-car, 40-knot trimaran. The Americans had some interest in that and they sent a small group of Navy people down to charter it and ride on the vessel. Uh, and So then I'll get back to the other bit, which is US Navy also invited me to attend a workshop they were having in Washington, D.C. at a, a research facility called Carterock. And the, the mission it was a three-day workshop on how could high-speed vessels help U.S. Navy? Their, uh, their uh, preference was to have something that was, you know, up to, could have a range of 5,000 nautical miles to get across the Pacific or the Atlantic. Uh, they wanted to do up to 100 knots of speed and have up to 10,000 tonnes of cargo. It was never going to happen, but it was never, nevertheless, sometimes you've got to move the goalposts. What I was quite quietly confident of that the large passenger catamarans that we're doing in Australia for Europe predominantly would work as a fast freighter in theatre type freighter for US Navy. Had to take a, a bit of a punt. On top of that, we weren't able to produce uh, commercial ferries for the US market outside of the United States. They've got something called the Jones Act, which does many things, but it prohibits foreign-built ships from operating on domestic routes within the U.S. So I figured we ought to be in the U.S., and I was taking a punt uh, that uh, Navy would sooner or later get around to these high-speed uh, freighters, if you like, in-theater freighters. So I traveled around the U.S. for a bit. I thought if we're going to be uh, in the U.S., Dealing with U.S. defense or military, we'd need to be a little bit American. So I looked for a equity partner uh, only from the perspective of the right profile in the U.S. So I traveled all around the U.S. and looked at all the ship bar yards and finally found a uh, suitable partner in Mobile, Alabama, which is where we are at the moment. Um, I guess just in case I forget to say it, they remained our partner for a period of time until we got our own credibility and we bought the, we bought the shares back. But nevertheless, they were our partners to start off with. Then um, we had that trimaran that I talked to you about in the Canary Islands that Navy were interested in. 
So General Dynamics, which you would know of, it's a, a large organization, approached us and said, you know, we, you don't have security clearance in the United States, so you can't build warships. You've got a design that Navy's interested in. Navy had come out of an attack on the USS Cole in Yemen, where a bomb-laden speedboat had run into the side of a destroyer and sunk the ship. So they started to rethink their high-speed uh, ability in littoral, if you like, coastal areas up to a thousand mile offshore. Um, so uh, we teamed up with General Dynamics uh, to bid for these new war fighting vessels to do that littoral area, which was called the LCS, littoral combat ship. Um, so we competed with uh, a number of bidders uh, for uh, to to win that uh, contract, and in the final uh, round it was two. It was um, Lockheed Martin on one side, and General Dynamics with the Austal one on the other side. In the meantime, I'd bought land in Mobile, Alabama, built a facility. Was, I had more courage then than what I'd have today, but. We didn't have any contracts, but I thought it would come. Uh, and I won a contract for a couple of large ferries for Hawaii, and that allowed me to build up the work, uh, the, um, the work capability, capacity, uh, work team, if you like. Um, and uh, we bid for the design of these littoral combat ships, and we were down selected. Lockheed Martin got a contract, we got a contract. So we then had, uh, and I think it's important, your audience is Australian, it's important to point out that I had something like about 60 or so young engineers in a, uh, in a, uh, a locked up facility not far from here working on that for two or three years. Uh, it was uh, classified, of course, as you can appreciate. Uh, nevertheless, all that design work was done here in Australia by young Australian engineers. So we then uh, we th we were then asked to bid um, for real ships. Uh, I then had the workforce numbers in the U.S. Uh, and uh, and again the facility was ours, the workers were ours, the design was ours. But Lockheed Martin, uh, we uh, General Dynamics, we needed because of the security issue. So I then. Uh, uh, we then bid for these ships with uh, GD as the prime, won a contract for two or maybe three ships. We built those. Um, and at the same time, the, or oh, during that period rather, the, uh, lit, the um, high speed freighters, in theater freighters requirement came up. We had secured our own we had gained our own security clearance in the US, so we were able to bid for that program in our own right um, and, and won it outright. Then Navy and General Dynamics worked out that we didn't really need General Dynamics in that uh, littoral combat ship program any longer because they were adding cost for not a lot of value. Uh, and uh, the next contract for LCSs, we won our own right. So collectively, and I'm getting to a final point, and I'm sorry, I've, it's been a monologue, but uh, but we collectively have we've almost completed our 19th littoral combat ship, and we're about to deliver our, our 15th of these. Um, freighters called EPFs. Um, so really, um, there's a total of 34 ships that Austal has delivered to US Navy, which if you want a statistic, it's around about 14% of their surface fleet. So there you go. But not by way of tonnage, only by way of numbers of ships. It does raise a good point because obviously Austal is, is such a successful Australian uh, owned and operated company, but it's sort of historically known just for doing the, the Navy ships, but it's also uh, its history is deeply rooted in commercial passenger uh, vessels and, and ferries and that sort of thing. 
How different is it, generally speaking, working with navies, be it the Australian Navy or the US Navy, as opposed to some of the other customers? I mean, obviously, you're dealing with classified information, a lot of decision makers. How do you get through a, a lot of that? It was certainly a learning curve for us, uh, dealing with a commercial customer, providing the vessel is built to the price and it's of good quality uh, and delivered on time, everyone's happy. Uh, with the Navy customer, of course, the whole process is much longer and, and entirely different. I had um, a good relationship with the Australian Navy uh, during our, we built uh, about 14 of these Armadale class patrol boats, such as you, you could see here today. Um, so we had a good relationship uh, during that period of time. We then concentrated on the US. Um, the US uh, Naval um, procurement people are very good operators. They And uh, good from the perspective of they're not pussycats when they're dealing with you, by the same token, they don't want to cut your throat. Um, and, and they've got smart people running it. Um, that might have been missing in Australia for a period of time, that common sense. But fortunately, of recent times, that's regaining that and we've, we're now back on a good footing. So two things happen. One is we may not have served the Australian Navy as well as we should have. Um, and again, that's reversed itself now. We're all back on friends again. Uh, and in the US, um, it was never really that hard in the... Uh, the, the um, US were very keen to have us there. So we've had a lot of financial support out of the US. Um, and I'm varying slightly from your question, but the difference between the US and here is if they want something, they'll go out and get it. So when we were first, when I was first considering where I should set up, the governor of Alabama came down with an entourage of people and said, you've got to be in Alabama. And, and uh, we, uh, the state of Alabama said, if you're going to be here, we'll build a training facility for you on site. You know, we then had uh, we had uh, support for um, if we grew our numbers of people, we had different grants on the way. Uh, so it's been very very supportive. Um, and uh, and then Katrina, the uh, the cyclone uh, uh, hit Mobile, and we got a big chunk of money from the U.S. Navy. A re um, uh, uh, recovery from uh, Katrina, although we hadn't really suffered that much. I had a, a, a pool of money there that they could distribute. Distribute More recently, uh, they wanted us to go into steel fabrication, um, and we, didn't, we were largely aluminium or aluminium, as they would call it, um, and uh, we needed to set up a workshop with uh, steel-making uh, tools, uh, they tipped in $50 million towards a $100 million investment just by way of a grant. So they're very good at doing that. Um, uh, so, uh, But in Australia, you don't really get that. There was, I don't recall ever having received any assistance here. Um, so it, it's just a different. The Americans wanted the trimaran. They wanted us to be successful uh, and, uh, and, and work towards that end. And... You know, we could come back to the U.S., but where we are at the moment is we, uh, uh, if, if it works for you, I'll just keep going. Where we are at the moment, we're uh, now also building uh, Virginia-class submarine uh, components. We built, uh, we've built. we just finished a whole module of the upper uh, deck structure of a Virginia-class submarine, and, uh, and much more will happen in that space with Austal in the future. Just to wrap some numbers around the sort of size and the scale of the business, obviously listed in 1998 and the business has grown its operations in Asia, Europe, the US for both commercial customers and, and military uh, customers as well. Tell us about the size and the scale of the, the business today, if you could, because it's an enormous operation with, with, as I said, operations globally. But give us a bit of insight into how many ships the company's built over that time and, and where it's at today. I don't have an accurate number in relation to ship numbers, but it would be north of 350 since we've started uh, in that region. Uh, the mix, of course, would be uh, far more commercial vessels, but it's now changing. Um, so 
the size of the operation at the moment, I would think uh, there's probably close to 4,000 people in the US as uh, we've reduced the numbers in the Philippines somewhat, but between there and here, let's say we're somewhere the other side of 5,000 people uh, globally. Incredible, incredible. And the business has been uh, a real thought leader and innovator, in particular with some of the recent technological innovations, Marine Link and Ride Control and, and others. Where has that um, sort of knack for, for innovating and pushing boundaries come from? Yeah, again, it was part of our uh, business model, or if you like, our business planning right from the start. We employed very smart naval architects here, and we still do. Uh, and uh, we have a, um, a, a, a fairly strong culture for innovation. Uh, the ride control system, the Marine Link, was a good example of that. Fundamentally, what it does, or what it started to do, was it allowed us to install that onto any ship that went anywhere in the world. It would allow us to here monitor everything about that ship, how the engines was running. We could tell you whether someone had left a watertight door open in Germany. Um, so, so we knew all that, and that was done in-house. Now, we've grown that marine link quite a lot. Uh, some of the technology is, is beyond me right now where we're at with it. But, for instance, uh, I'll give you an example. In the U.S., the U.S. government were keen for us to develop unmanned ships, um, and that means totally unmanned. Uh, so uh, technically there's no one on board uh, and the ship can go to sea. So that's in fairly early stages, but we've completed one of those that's operating just like that. Um, Australian Navy uh, also had an interest, and I guess the, the thought is one day we don't want to pe put people into harm's way if we can avoid that. Uh, and if we can send ships to sea without people on it, uh, that would be better. So Navy have uh, uh, worked together, are working together with us at the moment where they've fundamentally gifted us one of the retired Armadale class patrol boats that we built in the first place. Now we're using Marine Link to automate that ship and we're pretty close to uh, completing that at the moment where whilst it's illegal for that ship to go to sea on its own at the moment, the crew can go on board and put their hands in their pocket and just leave the ship run itself. So, uh, again, Marine Link was the foundation for that development, which is funded partly by Navy and part by us. Uh, so, um, innovative innovation, or if you like, a... Um, an R&D culture has been in existence since we first started. What have been the key ingredients when you look back at the Austral journey that have made the business so successful? First up, we'll talk about the people side of it. I don't think I, by nature, and and so with my, with my early uh, partners, had uh, any thought that there was anything that we couldn't do. We very much had a can-do attitude. We we're very determined to be successful and we were very uh, determined to be good at it. So then from there on, it became, uh, when I first went to China, um, I saw Swedish-built ferries and assumed we could do them much better than that, and we did, and we did lots of them. I saw Tasmania, again, let's not get too specific in this, but Tasmania had built uh, a, uh, a large vehicle ferry, and whilst it was good, I still felt we could do better and, and reach the market, um, uh, more of the market. Um, so it it was that we we deter we were very determined to do better. We also had that innovative uh, culture, which is uh, if we don't stay ahead of the game, someone will catch up. So we we just need to keep developing developing product. So why successful? Certainly, if I look at um, the big uh, game changers, was certainly the trimaran. Uh, they've become all the warships. Um, and they didn't really take off in a big way as a commercial ferry because the requirement wasn't quite the same as what it is. It's probably more suitable for military stuff. Vessel can keep its speed up in bigger seas and perhaps that doesn't often matter quite so much for a commercial ferry. 
But the development of the trimaran was a really big part of it. The uh, Canary Islands operator now has three ships operating, almost identical, and we've got one running across the um, the, um, the English Channel and so forth. But um, I don't know whether I've answered your question, but the success has been for a number of reasons, certainly our attitude towards what we should be doing, uh, not allowing uh, any barriers to be uh, to be put in our way, or if you like, don't no no barriers in our minds. We uh, we uh, moved them out of the road as as they came up. So I often get asked, "How did you do this uh, this U.S. thing?" Oh, I forgot to add one part to that. We built a high speed ferry. And it was chartered by the U.S. Marines in Okinawa. Um, and uh, that also helped our profile with the U.S. Navy. Uh, I'd failed to tell you that earlier in the whole mix. But, um, of course, that also demonstrated to the U.S. that it was a very suitable vessel for military use for the, again, largely, they carry, they carry uh, tanks and they have uh, helicopter um, landing ability and hangers on, on board the vessel and so forth. But, yeah, it's a combination of many things that uh, that allowed us to get to where we are. And then in, in terms of your professional career and your professional <coughs> journey, founding director, chief executive officer, and then you've served as non-executive chair, I think, since around about 2008. Um, you still come into the office regularly. You still like to have oversight of the business. Tell us about uh, the changes in some of those roles, as, as in particular going from CEO to, to non-executive chairman. What, what prompted that? I was constantly aware that a publicly listed company uh, needs to have some very smart people, probably substantially around the regulatory uh, 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 type issues in a listed company. Uh, so I felt that whilst I was good at building ships, whilst I was good at developing markets and spreading our, uh, ourselves around the world, I also needed people that could meet the criteria for a listed company. And on top of that, to be totally frank, I don't enjoy that because it's, it's, um, it's not what I do best. Um, so I then thought, first up, um, I, I put in place some... Um, a, a CEO or if you like a managing director type person and stayed on and then I thought I can do a fair bit all that I need to do from the sidelines so I became non-executive chair since then but I very much have control I don't want to say that in an arrogant way but there's huge respect and there has been by my past CEOs for what I do know and what I am good at and they cover my butt on the stuff that I'm not good at <laughs> Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's working working really well, and I enjoy it. A few questions to close out our discussion. I read a, a, a great quote of yours wherein you said, in the end, it is the satisfaction you get out of the business you build up that gives you the most joy. When you look back on your career, what would you say are your proudest achievements? Obviously, there are many of them. Um, obviously, our whole thing around the US and how successful we've been there um, I stay in a hotel in Mobile, Alabama, and uh, and I rang my president there one day and I said, hey, Craig, I'm seeing five hostile-built warships alongside your wharves right at the moment out of my window. Can you send a drone up and take a picture because I wanted it? But that they're private uh, and really proud moments. I, I think... Uh, I could I could list many of them. The first vessel into China, of course, was was really important to us. I I think the pinnacle was only last year, the middle of last year. Uh, to think that a uh, during um, during Scott Morrison's period, and uh, we had Trump at the other end. Uh, Trump promised Morrison that as he had, as Trump had an Aussie company building warships for the U.S. Navy. He was going to name one USS Canberra um, to, by way of a, a bit of diplomacy, I guess. Uh, they then uh, not only decided to name one USS Canberra, they then determined that what that ship ought to be commissioned in Australia. Now, just think about this. It is the first time in American history 
that a U.S. warship has ever been commissioned outside of the U.S. So it's sailing into Sydney Heads during uh, July of last year. It was a great moment, a fantastic moment. I've got lots of good pictures of it. But to have our warship that we've designed, we've built, albeit not on Australian soil, up against the Opera House and the, the bridge and so forth, was a pretty big moment. And of course, there were the uh, the functions around that but it was it was a very proud moment for me personally but for all our crew i think running a global business from australia how competitive are we on the world stage and you did mention uh, earlier but some of the cultural differences in, in running a business in australia versus running a business in the us what are they so first up, if we talk about running a business from Australia, I'm not quite sure whether I have your question accurately, but let me do my best. Running a business from Australia, what we've found in recent times, while we used to be very competitive building high-speed ferries in Australia, that was largely so because we were just smarter at it than our European competitors. Um, we, we knew how to manipulate the aluminium better than they did, and we were more determined, uh, so we built uh, better ships. That's gradually slipping away from us, and I felt some time ago that for us to have a longer-term future in the commercial ship world, we should be offshore, and we are, for that reason, in the Philippines. Uh, we've got a good operation there, um, and we built a couple of the really big ones uh, in the Philippines that's working really well. At the same time that decision was made, I and others made a decision we should be focusing on military ships in Australia. That's largely where we are at the moment. Um, so in Australia, the future is likely to be, uh, if not 100% military, then it'll be close to it. Um, we've just uh, recently had advice from Navy, which is public domain uh, information, uh, that uh, Austal's been selected as the, <clears throat> it, go back, uh, Navy want to have two shipbuilding hubs in Australia. One of them is Adelaide and Austal's it now for Western Australia. So that's a, a, a really important uh, change for us and, uh, and future for us. Um, so do I think we can build, what's in the past, uh, we've built uh, military type vessels for other nations. I built some for Kuwait from Yemen years ago when you could still do that when they weren't uh, considered rogue um, and uh, one or two others I guess. I don't think there's a real big market uh, for military ships to foreign nations. Almost everyone loves to have their own capability and capacity in country. Uh, so here our business will grow. There's a lot more defence work on the way that will be announced as time goes on, but we're looking good in that. If we're talking about the US, um, and again, I'm not sure whether I'm totally answering your questions, but I have no doubt, and there are all the signs here, stuff that I won't uh, go into great detail of, the US uh, defence have far greater vision for us than what uh, what is currently in the public domain. So the building submarine module is the first part of that, uh, but I think all of that that defence side of our business in the US will continue to grow. In terms of, and just generally speaking, you don't have to go into specifics, but uh, the risk of cyber, clearly Austal, given the, the classified information and, and some of the ships that you are building, that must be a, a critical consideration right throughout the process. How, what's been the impact of, of some of the cyber warfare that we've seen over, particularly over recent years? Almost everyone, uh, I mean, first up, first and foremost, you do whatever you can to avoid it. The US, of course, uh, and the regulators in the US are very conscious of the risk of it, and they have put a lot of um, conditions on us in the United States. We still occasionally get an attack, but so far there hasn't been a massive leak, um, and it's been marginal. Uh, Western Austra uh, Australia, we've certainly caught up in recent times. We've also had one attack, and I can't remember now, it must be a couple of years ago, uh, where they gleaned some of our information, but it wasn't uh, material, and, and we got away with it. But it's very much on our mind all the time, the, the risk of, of, uh, 
of cyber information, uh, of cyber attacks. Just in terms of growing the business over the years, and in particular the domestic manufacturing capability, one of the few uh, large manufacturers left here in Australia, how have you been able to position the business on a level footing with increased labour costs, increased cost of materials, um, changing political environments? How have you been able to just, just level the business out and continue to grow despite all these uncertainties? I think mainly because we had a product that our customers wanted uh, and we made sure that it was constantly developed to, to meet their needs. And our customer, of course, um, ranges from uh, commercial ferry operators to uh, military now. Uh, but uh, I, I, can, I, I think labour costs in Australia for a naval ship aren't quite so important anymore. Now the, the Australian government and defence are very conscious that we have capabilities in country. We used to buy a lot of stuff overseas. We don't so much now, but they do want their own capability, in-country capability. So um, I've told you the reason why we're in the Philippines, uh, to be able to, to build commercial ferries here in the future, car ferries, would be uh, you'd need to be an optimist to do that with uh, with the difference in labour costs. You've been in based in Perth in Western Australia since 1954. How have you seen the the evolution of the business landscape here in the West and and just Perth as a city? So between 54 uh, and today, I guess uh, there's very little of it you would recognise in uh, today of the 1954 look of Perth city. It is a massive sprawl. Um, and uh, and so much has happened. So, uh, and that is no doubt uh, the case in in other cities. Perhaps Perth is younger than some of the others, so it might be a bit more so here. So, from that perspective, I won't make too many comments. Uh, how does it look? Very different. Uh, even today, there is sometimes I drive there and I think, where the hell am I? You know, you don't look at our. Um, uh, Elizabeth Key, I don't know whether you've had a chance to walk around that, but it's, it's very different. All the high rise around that. It's just... So from a business perspective, Australia, or uh, I can probably really only talk about Western Australia, has always been conducive to people, to startups, people that want to have a go, people that have a plan. Uh, and in our case, Okay, it didn't uh, require a lot of capital to get going. Um, but I've seen signs, manufacturing is probably a little less so, but uh, even today, I think people that want to have a go can have a go in this country. I don't, we hear about red tape and barriers and so forth. I don't see their real, um, their real barrier for people. So, no, I think it's a very healthy business environment, particularly for new startup people with ideas. You mentioned in the early uh, part of the company's history that Standard Chartered Bank you took a punt and, and agreed to finance you when I think others along the terrace had, had, had shut up shop in that regard. You may not have an answer, but do you think it, there is that openness in the banking system now where people, if they've got a plan and an idea, will be able to get the backing? like you could back then, or do you think it's very, very difficult to be able to get the funding these days to, to fund some of these new ideas? Yeah, I, I think that is a particularly good question that I'm not sure I have an accurate answer to. We get on five of our bankers, but we're in a different world now than where we started. Um, it was certainly, I'm not quite sure whether, I'm not even sure whether Standard Chartered are in person at the moment, we'll assume they are, but uh, I'm not sure that if you knocked on their door now with the same question as we had for them that you'd get the same answer. So what we had, we had an entrepreneurial manager. Uh, as an example, I guess, um, at the time when I no uh, went down the terrace and knocked on doors, uh, we got answers from the terrace. When I knocked on the standard chartered door, the state manager and the development manager knocked on my door here and rocked up and, and looked at us and measured the people, thought about the risk they were really taken, and they took the risk. Whether they would be authorised to take risks of that nature today, I can't really, can't really answer you. Uh, Startups do seem to get going, but I think they're more often funded by private funding. 
through mezzanines and so forth. What have you learned throughout your career, both professionally and, and personally? I've, I'm repeating myself, but I thought without barriers, and and it's worked for me. And um, so would I do that any different now? I'm not as courageous as I would have been back then, but you are when you're 45 years old. It's a different world. I think I've learned that business is not very difficult. Uh, it's not difficult at all, and that almost sounds arrogant, but just uh, if things look compl- complicated, simplify them uh, and get it so that you clearly understand what you need to know and, and go for it. Uh, and uh, But you need determination, so you need some clear vision. I'll just throw a, a wild one in. the. Years ago, I was invited by... I don't even know whether the Standard Charter was one of the one of the banks to be the Australian representative in Singapore, where they were having a little um, loving, uh, and um, the there were six or so people in that loving, and they gave us uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the previous Prime Minister of Singapore, for half a day, and. I just watched him and I thought, if ever I've admired someone's simple skills, you're the man. Uh, He was, you know, sometimes you get a group of people and someone will ask a question on world events or world affairs of sorts. And sometimes you think, what the hell does that mean? I I don't understand that question. Lee Kuan Yew had the ability, someone might say, sir, what do you think about, uh, you know, world security? but they'd ask it in an awkward way. He would then clear it up and he said, are you really asking me this, that or that? And they'd say, yes, I guess that's what I'm... Oh, the answer's that. And, do you know, it was a, a matter of business is not too complicated. Don't allow anyone to make it complicated and fight bureaucracy with a vengeance. That's been one that I've had... Um, uh, I've always preached. It'll be on my... It'll be on my, my pin board over there, but bureaucracy can kill a business. So just, just, and of course, there's a level of that necessary as you get into the listed company space. You can't avoid that, but nevertheless, whatever you can avoid internally, don't don't do it. Um, a final question: What's next for John Rothwell AO? I know you spend a, a lot of your leisure time on boats and and scuba diving and diving and the like, but. But what's next that you that you still want to achieve, or have you done it all? No, I haven't done it all. This this place is not quite finished. Uh, I think we've got a few things to sort out right at the moment. So I haven't actually worked out a, a, a stop date. I I've just uh, determined that uh, when I think there's nothing much more that I can do for it, I'll get off. Or alternatively, I get too silly. You know, you you get beyond eighty, and you've got to start looking at yourself carefully, right? Uh, but um, beyond that, I have a range of interests. Um, I do a fair bit philanthropically, so there's quite a lot of um, research, medical type research that goes on. I have, uh, and it's today's too short to talk about it, but I have an interest in how Australia's handled its indigenous type issues, and uh, I'd like to think about that more and see whether I can assist in some way. Um, but uh, uh, and with that, as much boating and diving as I can fit in. John, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for your time. Thank you for being here.